chapter 28 of Matthew. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. I want to preach on this a few minutes this morning, the evidence of a risen Savior. We have evidence of a risen Savior. The evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ will hold up in any court of law in America. The laws of jurisprudence teaches that if eyewitnesses have given a testimony and agree in their testimony, and that testimony has been reduced to writing and no contrary evidence has been produced to overthrow the written testimony, the written testimony stands and cannot be disannulled. And so 2,000 years has come and gone. So what that means is there's never been one shred of evidence to disprove that these people saw what they said they saw. There's never been any evidence proven otherwise. By way of introduction, let me say that if this is true, if Christ had not risen, then sin would not be unforgiven. Salvation would be unfinished. The scriptures would be unreliable. Saints would be unbelievable. Uh, service would be unfruitful. Satan would be unbeatable. The sovereign would be unapproachable. Security would be unattainable. But he is risen. Therefore, sin is not unforgivable. Salvation is un unobstructable. Scriptures are unbreakable. Service is useful. Satan is the underdog. Saints are united. Sovereignty is unveiled. And for this reason, skeptics should be unsettled and sinners should be unnerved. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not an addition to the Christian faith. Christian faith, it is the Christian faith. Amen. The Gospels do not explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the Gospel. Amen. The Gospel is the resurrection. The resurrection is the Gospel. You cannot have one without the other. The Bible tells us, Paul said, that, the, that Jesus Christ died and was buried, rose from the dead. That is the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a nutshell, you take that out, you don't have a gospel. Thank God, brother, when you start talking about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not about imitating the life of Jesus. You can imitate the life of Jesus, and you can be good, you can be nice. I mean, you can do the golden rule, and you can do unto others as you'd have doing to you, and you can die and go straight to hell and burn in the lake of fire forever. You can be a good person. You, you, can, uh, I mean, you can be sweet and kind and nice. And if you could, and you cannot, but if you could live pure and never sin, which is impossible to do, but if you could live pure and never sin, you'd still die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven because of the resurrection. I'll give you a few things of the evidence of the resurrection. Number one, we have the evidence of Scripture. The Scriptures foretold of His resurrection. Psalm 16, 10 said, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Listen, the Bible tells us all through, even in the Old Testament, the Bible foretold that Jesus would die and raise again. Jesus Christ Himself, He told His disciples, He said, I'm going to die, but I'll raise again. But they just couldn't get it. They just could not get it. He told them plain. He told them simple. He told them in, in layman's turn. He told them just as plain and simple as I'm talking to you. He said, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men and I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. But in three days I'll raise again. 
They just couldn't get it. Not only Jesus tell of his resurrection, but David speaks of it. Isaac, Joseph, Jonah, so on and so forth. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 21, from that time, forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. But it's just like people today, brother and sister, it's hard to get people to understand. I mean, you can just tell them plain and just tell them and tell them and tell them and they just don't get it. But Jesus told them just plain and simple over and over that He's going to die, that He's going to be killed. But they were expected and looking for Him to overthrow Roman rule and uh, to overthrow the Roman rule in Jerusalem. And brother, they was not expecting and did not want to accept the truth that Jesus Christ well, had to die and that He came to die. And that was his destiny for him to die. Imagine, imagine he's here and he's raising the dead and you see him perform miracles. And then for him on top of that, that you see him raise dead people and heal sick people. And then he throws this in. Oh, by the way, I'm going to die in a few days. Whoa. Master, you're raising dead people. You calm the sea. I mean, you can do anything. I mean, the... I mean, the storms obey you. Little girls and little boys are raised from the dead. Demons are cast out and you can do anything. What do you mean you're going to die? That goes against everything. That goes against common sense. It don't even... What do you mean they're going to kill you? They don't have the power to kill you. You're God. It didn't make sense to them. A lot of times the perfect will of God don't make sense. That's right. It just don't make sense. Why would the perfect will of God be for a person to be sick? or to have cancer, or to have high blood pressure, or have heart trouble, or things like, things like that. But it's, it's the perfect will of God many times for the saint of God to suffer. That's what Paul said. Jesus said, it's the will of God for me to be delivered in the hands of sinful men and to be killed. They couldn't grasp, they could grasp that he said he was God. And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I can understand that, I can grasp that. But this killing part, I can't get that. But then he throwed in the part, they're going to kill me. And by the way, I ain't going to stay dead. <laughs> I mean, really, if you think about it, that would be kind of hard to swallow, wouldn't it? They're following him around for three years, and he's raising up dead people, and he's preaching, people getting saved. And following him, I mean, thousands of people. He takes, a, he takes a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread and feeds 10,000 people and got food left over. Got more left over than he had to start with. They had to have been Baptists, all them people gathered around eating. They had preaching and singing and eating, glory to God. That's where the Baptist church started. We didn't all shoot from the Catholics. Jesus started on the hillside over there on the Sea of Galilee when he fed all them people. I don't know. If it, I mean, he said fish. I don't know if it's some fried chicken in there, probably too, but anyway. But anyway, they said, uh, I'm going to be killed and I'll raise the third day, and they just couldn't. How would that, why would they, why would you let them kill you to start with if you can get back up in three days? It don't make sense. Why not just fight them all and don't let them kill you? What's the point in that? They didn't understand. Jesus had to conquer what Adam and Eve messed up in the Garden of Eden. Death was pronounced on man in the Garden of Eden and Jesus had to fix what they messed up. Jesus was the last Adam. He wasn't the second Adam because second would imply there's a third and a fourth, but Jesus was the last Adam. There was a first Adam, he's the last Adam. Well, Adam lost, Jesus regained. Amen. Amen? And so we see the evidence of the Scriptures. He said, all shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. And they're still, that's Matthew 26, they're still standing around scratching their heads, wondering what he's talking about. God himself smote the shepherd. God executed judgment on His own Son Amen. for you. Amen. Not only did the Jews put Him on the cross, and the Romans put Him on the cross, and your sins put Him on the cross, and my sins put Him on the cross, but God Himself put Him on the cross. Amen. There was no other way. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. The only way to pay for your sins is for you to either die and go to hell to pay for your sins, or for Jesus to die on the cross and pay for them. Amen. And you can have either one. You can let Him pay for them, or you can pay for them yourself. And you don't want the latter, I promise. If you pay them for them yourself, you've got to pay for eternity. 
You can let Jesus pay for them. You can let him pick up the tab. Or you can pay for them. We have the evidence of Scripture. The Bible says over and over and over, and it's never been refuted. The evidence of Scripture is that Jesus Christ died and rose again. Thank you back there. Praise the Lord. About time somebody got in on this. I'm trying to preach the rest of them up here to sleep, young man. Praise God. Teach him to say amen back there, sis. Amen. Glory to God. You teenage boys need to get a hold of that. Scott, go back and sit with him. Amen. <laughs> preach it. Teach him to say, preach on, Rev. Amen. Second. <laughs> he said that just the right place, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, we have the evidence of Scripture. People hear this on the radio and they say, what are they laughing about? <laughs> Lord have mercy. I wish we was on television or something. We'd turn the camera around. Hey, we have the evidence of Scripture. Not only that, but secondly, we have the evidence of the skeptics. Listen, listen. That's another reason we know Jesus rose from the dead. By the character of the people that try to deny He rose from the dead. We have the evidence of the skeptics. Let me give you this. Listen, we have five theories of the skeptics. Number one, we have the fraud theory. This is a theory that states the whole story is nothing but a hoax. Boy, that's a stretch, ain't it? The story of the resurrection of Jesus was just fabricated and made up by His disciples. Now, you've got to admit, that's a pretty big stretch, ain't it? That 12 men, they're hiding out somewhere and they made all this up. But then later, they died for it. They let them fillet them alive and drag them through the streets and crucify them upside down. Nah. Can't, can't, you can't buy that one. That's a stretch of the wildest imagination in the world, brother. There's no way. The second one is the swoon theory. This states that Jesus had simply fainted in the cool tomb and the spices used to clean His body revived Him. Well, if that's true, where's the body? If that's true, He was beaten and battered so bad, how come they didn't find His body and revive Him and produce a body later? If that's true, where's His body? bruised, beaten, battered body end up at. When they went to the tomb, how did they roll the stone back? And how come the Roman soldiers didn't stop them from going in and finding that beat up body? See, that don't wash either. The swoon theory don't work. The third one is the hallucination theory. The uh, hallucination theory, easy for you to say. That the states that the disciples wanted to seem so bad, they only imagined he rose from the dead again. Where is the body? How do you get all that many people to hallucinate? Over 500 people said they saw him. How do you get 500 people to hallucinate? That's impossible, brother. You couldn't get this many people to hallucinate. You'd have to be smoking some really strong stuff to get that many people to say they saw something. Wouldn't you? Amen. Number four, you have the ghost theory. states that only they only saw a ghost and thought it was Jesus. Again, where's the body? If it was a ghost they thought they saw, all they had to do is the Roman soldiers roll that stone away and drag his body out and say, there's his body. They didn't see nobody. If they saw a ghost right there, there's his dead body. That's all they had to do was drag his body out and drag it through the streets and say, he didn't raise the dead. There he is. Right? We have, the, we have the evidence of the skeptics. The fifth one is the myth theory. states that it was a wild story handed down through the years without any truth to it. If it is, it's the greatest myth of all time, brother. It's, it's, held, it's held airtight for 2,000 years. Amen. And everybody, millions of people, for over 2,000 years has believed every word of it. Amen. And if it was a myth, how did it get by so many people and why so many people died for it? That's the evidence of the skeptics. Number three, we have the evidence of the saints. The Bible said that the evidence of the saints is this. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. The saint, the fact of the saints is this. There's been people that has lived and lived by the fact and lived with their lives based on the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, just like you and me. We've based our lives on that one sole central fact. Our entire lives has based around that central fact, our, our entire lives. Our whole Christian life is based on the fact that He rose from the dead. Our life is not based on the fact that He rose dead people and healed people. The Bible said, Paul said, 
If, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But now Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection dead. Dead for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We have the evidence of saints. We have evidence of sinners too. If Jesus rose from the dead like he said he would, and he did, then he's coming back like he said he would. We have evidence of sinners. You know what that means? That means if it was he and Rose were dead, I mean you wouldn't be what we are. I'd still be a dope smoking, beer guzzling, liquor drinking, filthy mouth, dope headed the list goes on. I ain't gonna name all the rest of it, it's too nasty. But I ain't. I'm a child of God, I'm a saint of God, Baptist preacher. I ain't perfect. I ain't good. I'm still a sinner, but I'm a sinner saved by grace. I've been transformed. I've been changed. I ain't what I ought to be. I ain't what I want to be. But thank God Almighty, I ain't what I used to be. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm still a sinner, but I don't run to sin. I run from sin. Amen. I don't run to try to get in sin. I stumble into it every once in a while. But I'll tell you what, it's because of the resurrection that Jesus Christ saved me, changed me, well, transformed my life, and made a new man out of me. I ain't been the same since 1978. God did something for me. That's the evidence, brother. That's the evidence of the saints. That's the evidence of the sinner. That's what God can do for you. That's what God will do for you. Because of the resurrection, that's the evidence we have. How else do you explain a man or a woman can just be changed like that? You can't explain that to me. I've seen men in my life, in my ministry, I've witnessed it. I've seen it. I've seen it happen to me. I've seen it happen to some of y'all. I've seen it happen over and over and over. Men that's hooked on drugs, alcohol, pornography, all kinds of stuff. And they struggle and they fight with that and they fight with it. And they come to an old-fashioned altar and they're weeping, tears running out of it. And men don't normally cry unless, unless they're playing a championship game in a in, in uh, the World Series, and they lose, and they sit in the dugout and cry. Sometimes they do that. <laughs> I kind of sympathize with that. I mean, you play all year, and then you're like, oh, you know. Kind of feel sorry for them, but normally men don't cry broken like that, unless their mama died or something. But you watch a man come up here, and he weeps. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, brother? Yeah. Them tears are flowing. You can't stop it. Amen. Can't stop it. We've seen it right here, haven't we? Yeah. And they're blubbering, and they cry, brother Jeff, and they cry. And they cry so much, they're going, <laughs> and they can't talk. And try to lead them in a sinner's prayer, and you read the Romans road to them, and Romans 5, 8, and Romans 3, 23, and Romans 6, 3, and, <laughs> and they're doing like that, and they're crying so hard they can't even talk. And they pray, you pray, they get through praying, and, they <laughs> and they're blowing snot bubbles and all that stuff. <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, buddy, they got them a dose. And they get up and they say, Jesus, save me. And brother, you can see it on their face. That light comes in their eyes. They something different. People say, yeah, 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 I heard about that. That's, that's jailhouse religion. I've heard about some of y'all lately. I've heard that about y'all and I'm like, well, I've seen jailhouse religion too. But what that boy's got's real. Amen. I've heard that about one or two of y'all lately. People say, yeah, well... I heard he got religion. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did too. But what that little boy's got ain't jailhouse religion. Amen. I've been around a while. I've been a preacher for a long time. And I can tell the difference. You think I ain't got a little bit of discernment after all these years, 35 years of preaching? I can tell when they get it, man. I can tell when they're blowing bubble gum or when they're blowing snot bubbles. I can tell the difference. I can tell, brother, when they get up. From, I can tell when they lay on that altar and they cry 45 minutes or when they come up here and they're just like this. You can tell. You tell me how you explain a man like that. He gets up off that altar and he don't never want to crack pipe no more. Amen. He don't quit dancing. He just changes partners. He don't quit drinking. He just changes fountains. He can't put his Bible down. He can't quit reading it. Amen. He about worries his wife to death because he can't shut up talking about Jesus. Amen. Worries his friends to death. They run from him. He don't have to give them up. They run from him. Amen. They can't stand him anymore. That's right, ain't it? Yeah. I mean, all he wants to do is listen to preaching tapes or preaching CDs. All he wants to do is read his Bible and witness to people. And his friends run from him. They can't stand him. His wife can't get no sleep at night. It's all he talks about is Jesus. He wants to go to church seven days a week. You tell me, brother, that's not the evidence of a risen Savior. I tell you, you're crazy. Brother, I'm telling you, that's the evidence of a risen Savior in a man's life this morning. Listen, that ain't mind control.
your own brother. I ain't that good. I can't preach that good. I don't know a preacher that can. But I know a Savior that's risen that can do it. That's the evidence, brother. That's the evidence of the saints. and Lord, we got all kind of evidence. People, over 500 people saw him at one time. The eyewitnesses. We have the, the apostles. What about the apostles? The evidence of the saints. If, if it wasn't real, think about this. The saints of God that's died over the years for what they believed. A man won't die for a lie. You might make up a lie to get out of trouble, but you won't die for it. Andrew was crucified. Bartholomew was beaten and then crucified in India. James the Great, the older brother John, was beheaded in Judea. James the Less was beaten, stoned, and clubbed to death in Jerusalem. Jude, the brother James, was crucified. Luke was hanged on an olive tree in Greece. Mark was dragged through Alexandria. Matthew was killed with a weapon that was like a blade and, and a spike in uh, 60 AD. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Paul was beheaded with a sword in Rome. Peter was crucified upside down. Philip was scourged, imprisoned, and then crucified. Simon was crucified. Stephen was stoned to death. You remember him? Thomas was thrust through with a spear. The only one who died a natural death was John the Revelator. They put him in a, a bowl of oil, a, a cauldron of oil, and boiled him, and he like like fried chicken, and he didn't die. And they took him out, and took him out to Isle of Patmos, and he wrote the Book of Revelation. He's the only one who died a natural death. You think if they made all that stuff up, they'd go through that sooner or later? Somebody say, "Wait a minute! I just made it up. Don't kill me. Don't skin me alive." That's the evidence of the saints. We have the evidence of the supernatural. A man that watched somebody die, and then watched somebody raise from the dead, and, know, and then, then later never changed his story. Listen, today the body that's conquered on this planet is death, struts across this land and claims its victims, as he read about this morning, of every race, creed, and background of age. But the resurrection power that indwells every believer is greater than death. Hell in the grave. Amen? That's the supernatural evidence that we have. That He's a risen Savior. We have the evidence of the Spirit. And I'll tell you something, people. Jesus said in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. The evidence we have of a risen Savior is... I didn't realize it. I, I'd heard it my whole life. I'd heard it preached and sung about. But I just, get, I just didn't know, you know, because you're a dead man before you get saved. You just don't know these things. When I got saved, something happened. I got peace in here. And I woke up and I came to life. And something came to live inside of me, somebody. And it was Him. It was Jesus Christ in the form of the Spirit. See, Jesus Christ was here in the form of the flesh. But when he went away, the Holy Spirit came back Amen. in spirit form and he lives inside. Amen. And he's still there. Amen. When I was 20 years old, some of you, age of some of you boys here, I got saved when I was 20. And I remember that night. I remember that night. Ronnie, you can come on the piano. I remember that night I got saved. Brother Sam, it's so real. Amen. It's so real, I still remember it. I, it's so real. I, I got down to pray. I was under such conviction. I was broken. I got down to pray and I said, Lord, if there's any way you can do something with somebody like me. And just like that, the Lord saved me. I felt it. I know you ain't saved by feeling. You're saved by repentance Amen. and faith. But I meant it. I meant it with all my heart. I meant, Lord, I, I'm at the end of my ropes. I'm, I was about to commit suicide. That's what I was fixing to do. I'm fixing to run my car off a cliff. And the Lord saved me. And all that dirty stuff went out of me. All that guilt and shame and all that stuff went out and it felt like something clean came in. It was the cleanest feeling I ever felt. And it's like, I, it's like I started breathing fresh air for the first time. It's like before that I was breathing old, cold, dirty, cold, like I was living in a coal mine in the dark. Dusty, dirty, moldy air. That's the way it felt, spiritually speaking. That's the only way I can describe it. And when I got saved, it's almost it's like I woke up and the light came on and I was breathing fresh air on top of a mountain. Y'all understand what I'm getting at? I don't know how to explain it. I can't put it into words. But what happened was he moved inside of me. And that's been 
30 something, four, five, thirty-five 35 years, and he's still there. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me. Along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives salvation to his part. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. That's the evidence. If there was nothing else, none of this other stuff, you say, Brother Only, how do I know? How do I know? I can't prove it. I can't prove it. I can't prove any of this stuff, really. Scientifically, I can't prove any of it. But one thing I do know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that He's living inside of my heart. Amen. I can't prove that to you. I can't put that on paper. I can't show it to you on the screen. I can't show you on DNA under a microscope. I can't lay on a CAT scan and they can look at it and see it. But there's something living inside of me, Brother William, that wasn't there, that wasn't there the night before I got saved. And there's someone living inside of me. And when the choir starts singing, I can feel him moving around in there. Sometimes it feels like he's cutting flips, cartwheels. I was listening to, I was working on our Jubilee CDs. I was working on Jubilee CDs. Ronnie's putting them on the internet the other day. They're all on the internet now, on our website. Old brother Harry Nix was up here. Son, he is letting it rip. Son, he is in third gear. He's fixing, throw it in overdrive. And he's talking about, why I love the Lord Jesus Christ or something like that. Or I love him, this I know or something. Man, I could feel something down in my heart. So I was sitting back here at my desk, Brother Heath. And it felt the same way it did that night. I was sitting right there. Amen. I was sitting right there and it felt exactly like it did that night, that Friday night he's preaching. What is that? You tell me what that is. That's evidence, brother. Amen. That he's a risen Savior and he's alive. You can't make that stuff up. You don't get that in a rock concert. You don't get that drinking a beer or taking pills or anything else. Amen. That's the reality of a risen Savior. And you don't get that nowhere else. He's living inside of me. And if I didn't have anything else, I know. There's been times me and Debbie's been riding down the road before and listened to a preaching CD or listened to a song. And we look over at each other. Or I'll be riding and see her out of the corner of my eye wiping tears. He's real. He's real. You'll never, you might make me doubt a lot of things in this world, but you'll never make me doubt he's real. I'm too, I'm too old. I didn't mean it too long. You might have made me doubt it a week or two after I got saved, but not now. I didn't been saved too long. I didn't felt him in my heart for too long. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. And if you got any doubts about that this morning, if I was you, I'd come up this altar and I'd say, Lord, I can't prove none of this, but just give me that reassurance. Just let me feel your presence. Just let me know that you're, that you're here. And he'll do it. Sometimes, every once in a while, when, you, when you're feeling low and feeling discouraged and you feel like you can't feel his presence, maybe for you go through a dry spell, every once in a while, he'll just reach down and touch you and let you know he's still there. I ain't going nowhere, son. Remember that story? I told you that story. The little boy flying a kite. Remember that one? The little boy's out in the field flying a kite, and the man walks up and says, What you doing, boy? Some flying a kite. He said, Son, I think you've lost it. He said, That string's way up over the top of them trees. The flight kites probably fell. And the string's just up over them trees. And the, son, the boy said, No, it's still up there. He said, Son, that kite's done fail. He said, I flew kites my whole life, son. That kite's fell, and that string's just up over the top of them trees. Way up yonder, and it's just failed. You're just standing holding the string. The boy said, No, it's up there. He said, Well, how can you tell? He said, You can't see it. He said, oh, it's up there. He said, son, if you can't see it, and it's still up there, how are you so sure? He said, because every once in a while I can feel the tug on the other end. Amen. I said, amen. That's how I am. Amen. I can't feel him every day. He don't reach down and shock me with a bolt of lightning every day. But every once in a while, I'll feel the tug. Every once in a while, I'll feel something. Amen. I say, That's right. Amen. That's right. And I might not even be church when it happens. I might be riding down the road, sitting back here in my office, 
Or I might be laid in my bed half asleep and the Lord will speak to me and say, I want you to preach on so-and-so and the Lord just touch me. And I'll reach over and dig through my nights and then grab something and start writing it down. And I'll feel that tug. And you know what that tells me? That's the evidence of a risen Savior. He's alive. He's alive and well. He ain't sick. He ain't dead. He ain't even sick. People say he's dead. He ain't sick. I'll tell you how I know he ain't dead. Because when somebody dies, they notify the next kid and I ain't heard nothing about it. Amen. I'm one of his sons and if he's dead, I'd have known about it. Amen. He ain't even hard up. He ain't sick. He ain't even in pain or nothing. He's fine. Let's stand this morning.